Hey, it's me, Jimmy, and um, you remember Carl. Now, in this segment, we're going to be talking about job planning for qualified workers. Hey, Carl, you qualified? Oh, you bet. Well, what makes you qualified? I've been doing this job for almost five years. Well, that doesn't necessarily make you qualified. Oh, well, I was just assuming. Uh, 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 uh. No assumptions here. Now, according to the NFPA 70E and NEC, a qualified person is one who has skills and knowledge related to the construction and operation of the electrical equipment and has received safety training to recognize and avoid the hazards involved. To be qualified, a person must be skilled and knowledgeable through training or experience with the construction and operation of electrical equipment. And they've got to be trained to recognize and avoid the hazards of that work. Hey, that's me. I've had classroom training and on-the-job training. Good for you. Now, you can also be considered qualified if, while you're doing your on-the-job training, you demonstrate an ability to perform a specific duty safely, and you're under the direct supervision of a qualified person. But in that case, you may only be considered qualified to perform that specific duty. Just like an employee may be qualified to use certain kinds of equipment, but unqualified to use others. Here's what it all boils down to. To be qualified, a person must show documented proof of safety training on understanding, recognizing, and avoiding electrical hazards, or this is the employer's responsibility. The person must be trained to determine the nominal voltage and safe working distance around electrical equipment, be trained in the selection, use, and care of personal protective equipment, clothing, insulating tools, test equipment, barriers, etc., necessary to perform the tasks. Trained to perform the tasks safely and trained in CPR and first aid if medical help is not readily available in the workplace. And aside from all of that, he or she has got to demonstrate knowledge of the equipment operation and the electrical installation. Uh, are we all done? Not yet. Now, what's the difference between a qualified electrician and a qualified person? About 20 bucks an hour. <laughs> Come on, I'm talking about qualifications here. Well, me and the guys were just talking about that. Now, if I'm not mistaken, a qualified person needs to be trained to do a couple tasks, maybe only one. You're on the right track, Carl. The qualified person must also be safety trained to understand, recognize, and avoid the electrical hazards associated with the specific task, understand their limitations in performing the task, be equipped with the proper PPE and test equipment for the task, and know when and how to use and care for the PPE and equipment. So, how's that different from a guy like you, a qualified electrician? Well, for one thing, the qualified person didn't have to shell out a couple thousand bucks to go to trade school. Well, besides that, a qualified electrician must have a good general understanding of electricity, a broad base of technical electrical training, electrical safety training, and actual experience performing electrical tests. The ability to perform a wide variety of electrical tasks related to work environment. Appropriate PPE supplied by the employer to guard against electrical hazards encountered in the workplace and the knowledge of how to care for it. And training on the capabilities and use of test equipment. But no electrician is qualified for all electrical work, right? No, absolutely not. Now, let's talk about the job briefing. At the beginning of your shift, you and your crew should take a few minutes to thoroughly go over a detailed job briefing. This briefing should cover the hazards associated with the job that you're about to perform, work procedures for that job, special precautions that you may need to take, energy source controls, and the personal protective equipment required for the job. Okay, sounds good. We through here? No, no, not yet. Not so fast. Why? Well, Let's talk about those hazards. Why don't you give me a for instance? Let's see. Uh, you need to identify the voltage levels involved in the job you are about to perform. You need to identify the skills required to do the job properly and verify that you have those skills. You should identify any secondary voltage source, identify any unusual work conditions, be prepared with the appropriate tools and experience, identify the number of people needed to do the job. You need to identify the shock protection boundaries and the uh, available incident energy. And you need to identify the potential for arc flash. Wow. Carl, I'm impressed. Thank you. The only other thing that you might want to add is the general work environment considerations. You know, hazards that you need to consider if you're working on an elevated surface or if you're working in extreme temperatures. Right. 
Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about work procedures and special precautions. Uh, who's got time for that? You're standing here making your little video program. No offense. But some of us have real work to do. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. If you go rushing out there to start your work without thinking these things through, somebody could get seriously injured. Okay, what about work procedures and special precautions? Well, before you begin any type of actual work, you need to determine if the equipment can be de-energized. Are back feeds of the circuits to be worked on possible? And ask, is a standby person required? So I'm supposed to ask those questions? You're the only one who's going to be doing the work, aren't you? <laughs> it's crazy. They're not going to send me out to work on energized equipment without asking those questions first. Okay, you see? There you go again. What? You're assuming. Never, ever assume, especially when you're working on energized equipment. You don't have to yell. Okay, I'm sorry, Carl, but look, this is really important stuff. Next. Next, you should talk about the purpose of the task. Same as every other task, to get paid. Okay, wise guy, besides getting paid, you and your crew should talk about what you're trying to accomplish on this job. And you should also discuss the number of people needed to do the job, and what their qualifications need to be. Talk about the hazardous nature of the work and the limits of approach. Talk about safe work practices and the proper protective equipment that you'll need. Talk about insulating materials and tools used for this job. And what are the precautionary techniques you and your crew will be using? Do you have up-to-date electrical diagrams and equipment details to work from? And are there unique features about this job? Do you have sketches or pictures of them? And any other reference data that's relevant to this particular job? And you need to check that everyone on the job is skilled and knowledgeable with the equipment and the facility. Oh, that's my job? <laughs> that's everybody's job. Your crew needs to go through the checklist as a part of your pre-job meeting in the morning. Hey, you guys are the ones that are going to be poking around energized equipment. Don't you want to be as careful as you can? Yeah, but what about routine work? Routine work should be treated pretty much the same as repetitive tasks. A thorough job briefing should be conducted before the start of work on the first day. If there are any changes to the job, or if there are any new hazards that might be encountered, another job briefing should be held to discuss these. So that's it? That's pretty much it. That's not too bad. My crew could probably cover that in about 15 minutes. Hey, that's all there is to it. Make sure that everyone is on the same page, know what the job is about, what the hazards might be, and make sure that everyone is adequately prepared and protected. I could live with that. Oh, and one last thing. The last part of the job briefing and planning checklist is about preparing for an emergency. Uh, I, I don't like to think about stuff like that. Somebody does. But if something terrible should happen, it's better to be proactive, have the information ready, than to be reactive and try to figure out what to do when you've got a bad situation on your hands. Yeah, I guess you're right. Now, are you or someone on your crew trained to properly perform CPR? I mean, this could be the difference between life and death. Is emergency equipment available? And do you know where it is? Where's the nearest telephone? Do you know where the fire alarm is located? And if you're working in a confined space, is rescue available? Do you know the exact location of the facility where you're working? If you need to call 911, you're going to need to know this. How do you shut off the equipment in an emergency? And besides 911, do you know the other emergency numbers? Where's the nearest fire extinguisher located? And last, are radios or other communications available? Nobody on my crew has been injured for a long time. At least not a serious injury. Yeah, but if you or a buddy were critically injured, would you want your crew to be running around looking for emergency help? Or a fire extinguisher or somebody who knows how to do CPR? Wouldn't you want to have a plan? Sure, but most of these locations have people right on site who we could call. Yep, there you go again, Carl. Uh, I'm assuming again? Yep, and when somebody's life is in danger, that's a really bad time to be assuming. Okay, I, I think I got it. I sure hope so. Never assume and always do whatever you can to work on de-energized equipment.